All right, well, good morning, good morning. Hey, before I start my message, I want to recognize someone for their long years of service here. Summer Robinson has been with us in our daycare for 16 years. She's been here longer than most of our staff have been here. She started kind of at the bottom of the, on the daycare you know, workforce and rose all the way to assistant director. And uh, this past week was her last day with us. Her husband, Teddy, is, works with Enterprise and is getting a promotion. And they're moving to um, Morgantown to, as he takes a promotion there. Their house is sold. They're looking for a house up there. So I want to get them up here now. They stayed around this service in order to allow me to do this. We got them up front last service. So Teddy, if you would summer, yeah, bring the boys. That's awesome. And we're going to just have a special prayer for them as they leave us. It's always bittersweet when people leave. So come on up. All right. Good looking family. So again, summer summer's been here a long time. Touched many lives, many kids, parents, and uh, when she's there, there are parents now whose kids are in high school that um, that summer touched. So we're we're sad to see them go, but we're happy for them in their journey. I've asked Teddy, who was uh, uh, you know, our star shortstop on our softball team, not only to replace himself, but you might have already done that without knowing, but to go up and help Coach Hugs and those guys, you know, to get the, get the teams going. Yeah, we need amen for that. So, Summer, thank you. Thank you for your service. Now, uh, back here uh, where they just came from, Kayla McDaniel and Summer were assistant directors. Now, Kayla is the director and we've hired uh, Kayla Osborne, so we have two Kaylas who will serve in the director's jobs, assistant director and director, uh, who will be doing some of what Summer did for us. So pray for this transition, if you would. Pray for the transition for them and their family as they find a home in Morgantown and get into their new jobs, but also for us here at the church and the daycare as we transition to uh, you know, a little different way of doing things and some new faces in leadership. All right, so would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for this beautiful family here. I thank you for their love for each other, for for you. I pray, God, that you would bless them, favor them. Uh, They've sold their house, now help them to find a house. Pray it would be in their budget. I pray, God, that they'd make a smooth transition, that their work would just continue on, be touching people and anything they do. Pray for these little boys as they grow up, learning to love one another and their family and learning to love you. I ask you, God, to be with us in our daycare and this ministry that it might transition well and continue to thrive and be one of the premier daycares in our county and indeed in our state. I pray, God, that you would put your hand of favor on us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And of course, uh, we, we have an envelope for you. So you guys can help you, help you transition a little bit smoother, all right? Thank God bless you, and thank you guys. All right. All right. Now, I appreciate uh, not only the Robinsons, but uh, it's good to have Shane Armstrong here today. Shane is our new friend. We've been friends for a few years now representing Christian Financial Resources. You can pick up the brochure or see him out there in the main lobby today and talk to him. One thing that I want to say to add, and by the way, they were all here last service, so don't say, well, I want to go too. All right. (laughs) They already listened to the sermon. But uh, one thing you need to know about CFR is that not only are we being responsible as a church with our money, and I say our, I mean your money, our money, but we're being purposeful, purposeful. So we borrowed money, that's, they were our lender, to help us do our Taze Valley campus, and we wouldn't be able to do our Taze Valley campus in the fashion that we are doing without their help. 
And also, many of you are putting your savings, like I have a savings account with them, and that money allows them to loan that out while they're, I mean, they're a big, big uh, group who's really doing some good things for churches just like ours. So not only are we being responsible, we're being purposeful with our, with our money, with our funds, and I wanted you to know that. So hopefully you'll talk to Shane out there. You can talk to him while you're getting a flu shot, you know, and get, uh, get everything settled. Well, this is the seventh message. It's the next to the last message in this series, Faith with Doubt. Next week, we'll wrap this up. Then we'll have kind of a standalone week where we, don't, we do a message not related to any series. And then after that, I think Russ Jordan will be up here that week because uh, I'll be in Haiti. Lord willing, I'll be in Haiti. Still looking for one more person who'd like to go, by the way. And, um, and then the, starting in October, we'll start a new series that highlights our ministries and your opportunity to get involved with them. So this is the seventh. We got one more. So let's finish strong. Let's go across that finish line. It's been a little bit deeper than some series. I hope when you come into this place, you don't expect just something on the surface. I want to challenge your thinking. I want to challenge your Bible knowledge. I want to challenge the understanding of the Bible for you and your understanding of God and I want to challenge you in your walk with faith. Wherever you are, we want you to move a little bit further, closer to where God wants you to be. And let me tell you something, regardless of where you are, there's always another step to going with him, right? So we're looking at the root causes of doubt. We've said that you can have faith and still have doubt. It's very normal. It happens to all of us. Things happen in our life. And it causes us to have a little bit of doubt. You know, we have a moment of crisis or a storm. We've seen that doubt comes from the mind. Sometimes it's just a decision we need to make, a commitment, and we need to search for the evidence. We need to look for that evidence, and it's out there for uh, our faith. Sometimes our doubt comes from, uh, you know, our uh, decisions. We, uh, not just our decisions, but, you know, our, um, we, we decide that we don't want to follow him. We'd rather follow this other path. So it's a volitional thing. You know, we, and we get out here and we start living in the world versus living with Jesus, walking with him, and things start happening, and it causes us to doubt. We start listening to other voices. We start letting them speak into our life. They're doubting the existence of God. They're doubting the the presence of the Holy Spirit. They're doubting the historicity of Jesus and the, the accuracy or the integrity of the Bible. And we're letting those speak into our life. And so we have doubt because we've chosen to walk over here and listen to them and let them speak into our life. And letting, instead of letting the Lord and the Bible, his word speak into our life. Doubts come from a lot of different places. Last week, we looked at one of the hardest places to deal with, and that's the heart. It's when your dreams are devastated, when your life is crushed, like Jeremiah, who thought he had a good thing going when he was chosen to be prophet, but then he had a message to share that was unbearable. And so the people ridiculed him, beat him up, threw him in jail. And what do you do when your life takes a turn that you didn't expect, didn't see, didn't welcome? How do you handle that? You could doubt or you could have faith. And you can do both. It's not having doubt that's wrong. It's how you deal with that doubt. You got to deal with the doubt in the right way. Today we're going to take a look at one more before next week we kind of wrap up this whole series. Today we're going to look at another, maybe a something of the heart, but it's a little bit more than that. It's a, it's, it's a fear. It's unfounded fears that can cripple you, paralyze you, keep you from moving forward in your faith. And we're going to look at a story that's a very familiar story. It's in Matthew 14, if you have your Bible. Matthew 14 is the place where we find the story of Peter walking on the water. You remember that story, anybody, when you were a kid? It's a great story. It is a storm story. It is a lake story. It's a powerful story. And we're going to learn about this story. And in the process, we're going to take a look at what do we have to do when we face fears. And really, they're unfounded. 
So let's just jump right in here and let's start with verse 22. And we're going to work our way down through uh, this text. And then at the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you about three things to put into practice, all right? <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, I want you to notice right here off the bat that the Bible says that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. In other words, he forced them into the boat. He made them do this. Now, we, you know, we could, we could debate about how much he makes us do things, but there is a calling that when you decide to follow Jesus, which they had, they had all decided to come follow him. There is a, a, a calling, and then now that we're following him, there are, there are paths and there is a way that he requires of us. So he made them get into the boat. Why did he do that? And there are some reasons that people give, but there are, there's something that I think we need to look at here. Now we see this, uh, pat, this, this story in several of the gospels, but we also see it in Mark. Let me tell you the setting for this story. Right before he made them get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake, he just performed a great miracle. He fed 5,000 people with just a little bit of loaves and bread and loaves and fish. And so it was a great big miracle. It was an incredible miracle. I mean, the people that were there were like, what in the world? This basket never runs out. It is like a, one of the old-fashioned church meals where you keep going back and it's just keep, it stays there. Can I get an amen on old-fashioned church meals? Yeah. So here's what John's gospel says that Matthew doesn't tell us. This is John's gospel, the same story. Now, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. And I want you to pay attention to this next part. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So you see what's happening there. This miracle was quickly recognized by the people as an incredible miracle, something they've never, never seen before. Jesus knew that there was some clamor there, that you know, there's some excitement that he is really the Messiah. He is who he said he was, and let's go ahead and make him king. It's kind of like grabbing that football star and putting him on your shoulders, you know, just scored the winning touchdown. Kind of like Philip didn't do in the story last week that he showed. You remember that story? And uh, put it on your shoulders and you march out with him. Jesus knew they wanted to do this with him. But as he said many times before this, it's not my time. You know, he told his mother at the wedding in Cana of Galilee when she said, we need some wine and you need to help us. He said, it's not my time. He knew it wasn't his time. You see, his time, well, there was only one time that was his time, and that was when he went to the cross. And it's really every time is his time. When he went to the cross, and that whole story, which we call the gospel, that's his time. So he knew that they were going to force him into something that he did not come yet to do. You know, Jesus is king. He's always king. But he's not going to reign visibly as king yet. That's a future thing. But he is king. He's king of my heart, king of your life. But the world one day will all bow to him. That's what the Bible says. Every tongue confess, every knee will bow to him, to Jesus as Lord. But not yet. And so he knew this. So that's why I believe he made the disciples go ahead because they, I think they thought, well, maybe they should stay and help. They should stay and do crowd control. Maybe they should stay and help hoist him up. Whatever it was, Jesus said, this is not going to happen. You guys go on. I'm going up here to pray. That's what he did. All that from the first verse. <clears throat> so this is, this is what Jesus did. He pushed them out into the water, and he went up on the mountain to pray. Now, you might remember this lake. You might remember this same boat. 
You might remember that on this lake, in this same boat, with these same men, there was another storm. If you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the storm where Jesus was with them that time. He was with them in the boat. And what was he doing? You remember? He was asleep. He was taking a nap, which you're going to be doing here in a few hours, right? Perhaps. And so he was taking a nap, but he was with them. That's Luke chapter 8. And we talked about that moment being a stalled growth moment. In other words, Jesus, they were afraid. They woke him up. Don't you care that we're going to drown? And he said, where's your faith? I know you have faith. And here's a storm. And that's what your faith is for. It's for the storms of life. It's for every day. Use that. And so he reminded them that. But now I think what he's saying with this storm They're going on ahead. He's up here on the mountain. I think he's saying, look, you learned to trust me when I was with you in person. Now I'm going to teach you to trust me when I'm not with you in person. That is, when you can't see me. Of course, we know that the Holy Spirit is always with us. But Jesus is teaching his disciples a lesson. He did everything with a purpose. He didn't do anything haphazardly. He's teaching them this lesson. Okay, we had a storm moment. I was with you. We handled it, right? You saw that I was, had power over even the waves. I'm not with you now, but I still have power over the waves. I still got it. You guys are out there. Verse 23 says, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, don't miss this picture, all right? Don't miss this. This is the picture of your life and mine if you have, if we have decided to follow Jesus. It's a, it, we're, we're going to spiritualize this text. Here's a text where the disciples are actually in the boat. Jesus is up here on the mountain, and they're going out. And the more time that passes, the harder it gets to row. The storm gets more fierce, and they're getting further away, they think, from Jesus. and And the side of the shore where they first got into the boat, and the further they go, the harder it gets. Now, if we spiritualize that, which we can, and we will, that's our life. I decide to follow Jesus. Therefore, he now has control or command over my life, and he says to go. And so I go. I obey. That's called obedience. He says it. I do it. I don't know if that's your relationship with the Lord, but that's the only relationship that works with the Lord. He is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all all. However, the further I go in life, the harder it is to obey him. I don't know if you've heard me say this before or Philip last week, but we are always as believers swimming upstream. We're always pushing against the tide. We're always working upstream. The flow is against us. Now, if in your life, you're just going with the flow and life is easy and there's nothing, no problems, no, no heartaches and, uh, you know, everything's hunky-dory with you and every, life is good and you never have any issues, no pushback from our culture, no pushback from any of your friends on social media, then you might want to take a look at the direction you're going. You might be headed downstream And there's a big waterfall down there, and who knows what's swirling at the bottom. And that's not where you want to go. No, you and I are called to go upstream. We're called to go upstream against the waves, against the wind, against the tide, against the culture, against the current. That's what we're called to do. And the further we go, the harder it gets. I've been around a little while, as have some of you. I grew up in a time, as did some of you, when it was a whole lot easier to be a Christian. I don't know if you agree with me. We can debate this later. But I think, I think it, the, in times past, there was not the ridicule or the criticism or the 
ostracism. That means, you know, we just kind of kind of make you feel like dirt. There wasn't the marginalization where, you know, Christianity is just, it's important for some, just push it over to the side. We don't really let it influence us. It can't influence how I think or the decisions I make. It's just for Sunday. I think in earlier times, it was easier to follow Jesus than it is today. I don't know if you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, we can talk about that. If you're saying, no, it's pretty easy with me, man, I'm just going then maybe you need to look at the direction you're going and what you're not pushing back against. And so this is our picture, and we're wondering, where's Jesus? Man, it's getting hard. It's hard to row upstream. It's hard to live this life. It's hard to make these decisions of what I'm going to watch and what I'm going to listen to and how I'm going to talk and, and uh, you know, how I'm going to spend my money and all this stuff. This is getting harder and harder to do. And do it in a way that honors Jesus. You know, we got all this other stuff thrown into the mix, like this pandemic and, and this, uh, you know, and vaccines and masks and division and hatred and uh, taking sides, all this stuff. And it, we're wondering, you know, what, what do we do here? How are we going to continue to go the way he called us to go? And so we were wondering, where are you, Jesus? You know, that's what they were wondering. You know, he put us in the boat, he pushed us off, but where is he? It's getting tough out of here. I want you to remember, even though we can't see Jesus, he can always see us. He can always see us. Mark, in Mark's gospel account of this story, he tells us in chapter 6, verse 48, he said, Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars. So he's watching this. He saw him straining, but he's in no hurry. He's in no hurry. Again, he's trying to teach them, you trust me when I'm with you physically. Now I'm teaching you to trust me when I'm not with you physically. I want want you to trust me at all times. You see, he's not concerned about the storm. He's concerned about their faith. It doesn't matter how big your storm is. I mean, you could be going through the worst. He's concerned about the size of your faith. And so the struggles of life come, and that's where God forges our faith. Someone said it's darkest just before dawn. Well, look at here, verse 26. I'm sorry, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Shortly before dawn. Now, remember, he pushed them off the prior evening because he just fed them 5,000. It was evening, it was still daylight, and he pushes them off to start. Now it's already just before dawn. That's, a, that's several hours of struggling, of work, of exhaustion. Verse 26 says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, see, Jesus finally decides to walk down the mountain. I don't think he was in any hurry. Walk out on the water. Defy the laws of nature. Defy everything they'd ever thought could happen. And when they saw him, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, you know, we're on this side looking back at it. We could say, come on, guys, it's Jesus. Come on, don't be afraid. We're on this side. They're seeing something that had never been done before. By the way, it's never been done since. Somebody walking on the water. There are no stepping stones in there. That doesn't happen. They, they weren't 21st century men, but they understood the basic laws of science, and they know that was not possible. They knew Jesus. He also was a man. He ate dinner with them. They spent a lot of time with him. They knew how big he was. They knew his shape. They knew his size. They knew everything about him. They could have maybe seen him, but they didn't recognize him. They thought it was a ghost. And so... Verse 27 says, Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Don't you think they're hitting themselves on the head again? (sighs) He did it to us again. He did it again. Why were we so worried? And they have another incredible glimpse of his glory and power. You know, just when you think you've seen all of Jesus, 
you realize there's more of Jesus to see. I mean, have, have, you, ever, have you ever been on a drive somewhere, maybe out west or maybe some picturesque place around here? There's some beautiful spots in West Virginia, aren't there? I mean, you could go to, uh, you know, up, up in the other part of the state. Uh, you could go down here to Fayetteville and just see. Or you could stay right here at home. There's some beautiful spots right here. And maybe you drive by, by this place and you see it, and every time you see it, it takes your breath away. That's the way I am. I've, I've been to the Grand Canyon three or four times in my life. Every time I see this place, it's like breathtaking. I'm like, wow, it's better than my memory was of it. It's better than the postcards. It's better than any pictures you can see. Seeing it in person is like, wow, that again is, I marvel at God's handiwork. I marvel at it every single time. Or maybe it's just a, a flower or a bug or something, and you're like, wow, that's incredible how that thing acts and, and, and what it's created for. I think this is what heaven's going to be like. People say, oh, it's going to be so boring up there. I think this is what heaven's going to be like every day. I think we're going to wake up if we sleep. I don't know, really. I can't imagine not having a nap, but we're going to wake up every day and get a a fresh glimpse of Jesus. It's going to take our breath away. I mean, do you know that feeling? It's a feeling, wow, I'm so glad I'm here. I think that's part of what heaven is going to be like. It's going to be that experience of that rush of adrenaline, that rush of satisfaction, and that rush of that overwhelming feeling that, man, I don't deserve to be here. I don't don't deserve to be here at all, but because of him, I'm here. So I think that's what they experienced here. It's like, man, we thought we knew he, he had power over demons and disease and death and he had power over sin but now he's showing he's got power over nature defying the laws of nature so peter peter said if it's you lord tell me to come to you on the water i think what peter's doing here is saying i'm not really sure it's you but i know you and if you say it i believe it and so if you'll tell me if it's you you tell me to come i'm not just going to come I'm not going to do my own thing here. I'm not going to come up with my own ideas here. I'm not going to try to outdo you. Yeah, I think some people try to try to outdo God. I'm not. I'm not trying to, you know, make a name for myself. You know, in Mark's gospel, which was dictated by Peter, there's not even in this story. There's no mention of Peter walking on the water. That's interesting, isn't it? That was Peter's gospel. Mark, he's the one who told Mark the story. But in Mark's account, he, Peter, did, he leaves this part out. He said, well, we won't talk about that. This is about Jesus. It's not about me. And so he knew that what God calls you to, God will pull you through. So in verse 29, Jesus said, come, come, come on, man. Man, you got to watch the chosen. Uh, you can see Jesus' expression. You can just see, come on, man. I'm having a blast out here. And this is Peter's big moment. God said it, so I believe it, and that settles it. He got down out of the boat and walked on the water. You know, there ought to be asterisks around this. A man, not God this time, but a man walking on the water. The only man who's ever experienced that other than Jesus. What an incredible time. But then we know the story, don't we? We know the fear factor sets in. And the Bible says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? You were doing great. Well, Peter saw the wind. He saw the wind. I want you to understand three things. Here's three applications. Number one, understand the power of fear. Fear is not just an emotion. Fear is a debilitating condition. If it were just an emotion, we could brush it off. We could stifle it. We could go on with, with it, you know, coincide with it. But fear will absolutely paralyze you. 
And in order to move past your fear, you got to overcome your fear. I don't know if you remember, there's, someone said there's 365 places in the Bible where, where God says, don't fear, don't be afraid. Now, I haven't personally counted those, but I'm going to do that one day, maybe when I retire. I'm going to count them and make sure that's right. But it makes sense. He, did, he doesn't say, do not laugh or do not cry. He might say that a time or two, but he doesn't say it 365 times. He says, do not fear. Because he knows that the point of your fear, the point of your fear is the stoppage of your faith, if you let it. The man, the servant with the talents, he said, I was afraid, so I hid your gold in the ground. Moses sent 12 spies into the land. Ten of them came back and said, can't do this. God said, you can do this. God's just saying, go check it out and get, get ready. They said, we can't do this. We're afraid. They're big and we're little. After all they had seen, those people of Israel, how dare them say, we can't do this. I mean, look at what they had done with God. They said, we can't do this. So God said, okay, we won't do it. So fear can absolutely stop you in your tracks. Paul said to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. It gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Some of you have a temperament, personality feature that deals with fear a little bit more than others. You know, there are some people who just are afraid. Maybe they're afraid of speaking out. They might be afraid of being alone. They might be afraid of a disease, a virus. They might be afraid of, of um, uh, what's going on in our world. I read a tweet yesterday, and here's what the tweet said this, but it should have said this. I'm not going to tell you what it did say, but I'll tell you what it said. The tweet said, if, it, rather the tweet should have said, if I weren't a Christian, I'd be worried. That's great, isn't it? If I weren't a Christian, I'd be worried. Now, in all disclosure to you, the word Christian was substituted by another version of Christianity, which is perfectly fine, but really it should have been. If, I'm, if I weren't a Christian, I'd be worried. And you look at things going on in the world today with the unrest and the, you know, things happening with other nations pressing in and the, kind of the, the decreasing of our military and our values and our culture and things going the way, man, I'd be worried. I'd be afraid if I weren't a Christian. But I am a Christian. So understand that wherever your fear is, and you have a fear, whatever it is, if you'll locate that, if you'll identify that, that's where you need to grow in your faith. That's where you need to grow in your faith. You're like, man, I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. I don't have it. Really? How about losing all your money? You afraid of that? How about losing your wife? Losing your husband? What about your kids? What if you lost your kids? Now we're getting down to our fears, aren't we? How would, how would we not be afraid of that? And that's where, that's where God says, trust me in everything, in everything. I've done funerals of young people and old people alike. There's nothing in this life that we should be afraid of. There are unfounded fears, but it can stop us. So that brings me to the second thing. We need to understand the logic of faith. The Bible says, when he saw the wind. Now, how many of you remember Dale Earnhardt? Anybody? They say Dale Earnhardt could see the wind. <laughs> But really what you're seeing is the effect of the wind. This is illogical. Think about it. What Peter is saying here is, Lord, tell me to come to you and I'll walk on water as long as the weather's good. As long as the weather's good. But if I see the wind, I'm not going to trust you. That's what happens to us. You know any fair weather Christians? And as long as things are going good in life, as long as we're able to have a good life and things are fine and we're all happy, 
But as soon as tragedy strikes, as soon as a crisis hit, oh, we're throwing faith out the door. I'm all worried now. I don't know what I'm going to do. Do you believe that God can forgive your sins? Yes or no? Yes. Do you believe that God can save you? Yes or no? Do you believe that God is able to resurrect your body and present it a new, a new body? Do you believe he has the power to do that? Do you believe that there's a place called heaven where believers in Jesus will spend eternity? Yes or no? Yes, we believe all those things. Do, do you believe in the big things? Yes. And why can't we believe in the little things? Help me out here. You finish this verse. In the beginning, God. If you can hang on to that verse, the rest of it's no problem. Not one miracle, not one storm, nothing. In the beginning, God. How about this one? The Lord is my shepherd, I... How come only this side is answering? What's wrong with this side? Let's try it again. The Lord is my shepherd... I shall not want. If you believe that, it only makes logical sense that you would trust Jesus in everything. Finally, to deal with unfounded fears, I believe we need to practice the discipline of worship. Peter took his eyes off Jesus and put them on the wind and the storms. He began to sink. It was only when he put his eyes back on Jesus and cried, Lord, save me, that he was able to be saved. That's the definition of worship. It's a soul gazing on the Lord. I love our focus verse. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. That's what worship is. That's why it's so important for us to come together You know, that's why I think the pandemic, this virus is a tool of the devil. It's a tool of the devil because it's keeping us apart. It's pushing us away. But everything we do in this place is worship. Our fellowship is worship. Our songs are about him. Our communion time is about him. The offering is about him. The sermon is about him. Everything is is to help us get a better glimpse, a better gaze of Jesus. And we do it together because it helps us do it together so that we can go and do it when we're scattered. That's the discipline of worship, is that we come in here to do it, to kind of work out so that when we go out there, we can do it out there too. That's the discipline of worship. And the more we worship, the more we see of Jesus, and the more we realize there's more of Jesus to see. Verse 32 says, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I love what Charles Price said about this passage. He said, The, the waves that threatened to be over Peter's head were under Jesus' feet. What is it that's threatening to go over your head? Whatever it is, Jesus is on top of it. He's got it. That's my word for you today. Would you stand with me as we close with prayer? Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Thank you, God, that you're in charge when we can see you and when we can't. Thank you, God, that you have a purpose and a plan for our life. I pray that you would help us in the storms to not just face our fears, but by your spirit and your grace and your help to push through them. Oh, Lord, to sit at the feet of Jesus while on the cross where he paid the price for our sins. Oh, God, that's what we want. We want to gaze at him, the blood he shed, the life he gave for us. That's my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you...